So uh, I suggest we get underway. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jim Miley, and on behalf of the IUA and SkillNet Ireland, I'd like to welcome you to this uh, information webinar, um, which uh, we're looking at how universities uh, are and can engage more uh, with SkillNet Ireland. Um, we have uh, representatives of all our member universities uh, attending today's webinar. Uh, we also have a number of other guests um, from the Department of Further Higher Education and other stakeholders uh, sitting in. So we look forward very much uh, to the discussion and information that we'll be sharing. Um, I want to thank, my only job really is to, is to get things underway. I want to thank Paul Healy, uh, whom we'll be hearing from shortly. Uh, CEO of SkillNet Ireland for their collaboration uh, in this webinar uh, and uh, want to welcome all of you and hope that uh, you have an enjoyable and uh, beneficial um, lunchtime hour or thereabouts. So uh, with that, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Nora Trench-Bowles, who is uh, our head of lifelong learning and skills at the IUA. Uh, and Nora will take us through what's about to happen in the next while. Nora. Thanks very much, Jim. Um, and uh, thank, thank you all uh, for tuning in uh, today. Um, as Jim said, uh, my name is uh, Nora Trench Bowles and my uh, role is, is as head of, head of Lifelong Learning Skills and Quality at the IUA. Um, I'm delighted uh, that we're uh, facilitating this conversation uh, today and uh, really, really glad that you can all uh, be here. Um, so what I'll do, as Jim said, is just quickly run through um, our schedule for today, uh, which will bring us up to no later than 2 p.m. and we may uh, finish a little, a little bit uh, before. Uh, let's see how we go. Um, and I'll run through a couple of housekeeping uh, points. Um, but first and foremost, let me um, introduce the speakers who you will hear from uh, today. Um, so first up, we will have uh, Paul Healy. Paul Healy is the Chief Executive of SkillNet, SkillNet Ireland. Um, Paul will be uh, presenting um, and give, giving us an overview uh, of SkillNet, what it is, how it works, and crucially, how the universities uh, do and, and can uh, get involved. Um, we will then hear about a specific, uh, specific example of um, current uh, university skill net collaboration. Um, we'll be hearing from uh, Dr. Roisin Donnelly and uh, Maeve Coleman from uh, Technological Un University D Dublin. Um, they'll be presenting on um, a long running uh, Masters of Science in uh, Leadership, Innovation and Technology which TU Dublin um, delivers in collaboration with SkillNet. Um, Roisin is the head of, head of School of Management in TU Dublin and uh, Maeve is the programme chair of that particular uh, master's in question. Um, we were also to hear today from um, Dr. Amy Jane Troy um, from the School of um, Food and Nutritional Sciences in UCC. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, Amy Jane was um, struck with, with illness um, today, so uh, she can't uh, join us, but she has shared her slides. So what I might do once we've had our uh, first two presentations is just say a few uh, words from the UCC perspective. Um, and we abs absolutely send our, um, send our best wishes to Amy Jane to get well soon. Um, so the two presentations that we're about to hear will be fairly short um, and thanks very much to the, the speakers for uh, fitting in so much information to a short to a short time um, we have deliberate deliberately left plenty of time uh, for Q a and um, which the speakers uh, will kindly be here for because um, I suppose the, you know one of the purposes of the uh, webinar today 
is for it to be as as informative and as interactive as possible. So we really do encourage questions from uh, the audience. Um, in terms of housekeeping, we would ask you all to maybe keep your microphones on mute during the presentations and to direct any questions you have uh, through the chat function, which we'll be keeping a close eye on. Um, and then when we get to the question and answer segment um, of today, uh, please feel free to um, use the raise hand uh, function and then I can um, invite you in to unmute your microphone and um be part of the discussion um so uh, oh yes to also note that we are recording today's session um and we will make the recording available um with the presentations that the speakers will give um after the webinar so with all that being said um i would like to hand over to paul please to um share your slides and um talk us through your presentation Presentation, please. Thank you, Nora, and, and thank you for, the, for that a, a very, very helpful introduction and, and positioning it. I'm just going to share, share my slides first. If they pop up there, you might just nod, Nora, if they've popped up. We can see them. Thanks very much, Paul. Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and um, it's wonderful to talk to you all and a warm welcome to you all, and thank you for being with us at this afternoon at lunchtime, and particular thanks to our colleagues in IUA for hosting this. We think this is a wonderful collaborative opportunity. We're seeing tremendous success in terms of how skill nets are engaging with the university system. Really, really good outcomes, really good programs being, being developed and being delivered. And we want to share that story with you this, uh, this afternoon to tell you a little bit more about it, to maybe play in English it in terms of how it works, you know, what the access points are, the easiest ways to reach out and to collaborate together and so on. Um, but before we do that, I just thought it would be helpful just to share a little bit of background about the Skillnet Ireland organisation. Um, many of you be very, very familiar with this, of course, but just to set that scene again and to give you a sense of what the organisation is and what it does. So we, we, we are, uh, first and foremost, a government agency. We are a talent development agency and we're under the Department of Further and Higher Education. And our job is to boost the productivity, the competitiveness of the business sector here in Ireland. And of course, we do that through upskilling those who are in employment and to developing the skills of the work workforce. And all of us in this call recognize how important a highly skilled workforce is to, en to any country, wherever it may be. But for Ireland, it takes on an added significance. Why? Because to a large extent, we compete on the basis of our people and on the basis of our talent. So therefore, rigorous attention, rigorous um, investment and so on is, is needed in the skills of the workforce to ensure we stay at that leading edge. And most of all, to, to maintain that global competitiveness that we, we can offer and that we bring through a highly skilled and agile responsive way, workforce that we have. And I suppose how we go about this you know, uh, we do it in very much what we would call an enterprise-led way, where, where we are working at the coal face. And what does that look like? So we're enabling companies themselves to determine what the skills gaps are, to determine what they need. And, you know, we work with each individual skill net network to put in place the, the, the programs. So what we're doing is demand-led, it's driven by market need, it's driven by the needs of companies and from the coal face. And we are very fortunate to have uh, 73 partner organizations, industry partners, and they span a really broad scope, mainly se sectoral organizations, you know, and, and across the key sectors, the obvious sectors, you know, life science, technology, uh, retail, and many, many more. And then other sectors such as the space industry, the sustainable finance industry, the design industry, and many, many more. So of the 73 industry partners that we work with, each of whom promotes their own uh, distinct skill net network, who undertakes all of the kind of engagement with the companies in their membership to find out and diagnose what the skills needs are and what those gaps may be. And yet again, we work together with our skill net networks to provide the programs and the responses to those gaps and those opportunities actually as well that have been recognized by, by, by our partners. And I just wanna extend a warm welcome to many of our partners from the skill net networks who, who are here on uh, the call with us, who are wonderful supporters of, 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 of uh, sessions like this. And hopefully we'll hear from some la la later on. So to our core, we're a partnership organization. Skill Net Ireland itself 
Excel that doesn't deliver any programs, doesn't deliver any, any, any courses. It's entirely done through these fantastic industry partner organizations that we work with. And you can see the, the, the span and scope of the type of skill nets that are out there. There really is a skill net for every network and every region. And it's important that I don't forget the, the regions as well. So on top of the sectoral bodies that we work with, the sectoral industry groups, we also work with 21 different regional bodies. Some are chambers of commerce and others are various different enterprise, rural enterprise development organizations of different kinds. And they're giving this wonderful reach right down into the regions, to the small firms and the locally traded sector and so on. as well as those in the SME sector across the economy. So really important work undertaken there. And um, kind of areas of, of focus, you know, and probably no surprises in what people see there, you know, very much aligned to what government want to do in terms of policy priorities across skills and across enterprise and equally aligned to what we see on the European skills agenda. So a big focus for us uh, and a major priority in terms of our investment is digital skills. Um, not just you know the higher end digital skills, all those are important, but also the skills that are required to help smaller firms digitalize, you know, and and all shapes and forms that 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 comes in. Obviously, the huge huge challenges that are pre presented by by climate change and the related responses through climate action demand intense amount of upskilling and training jobs of the future. We hear, for example, in, in, a, in a, a fairly detailed uh, piece of research commissioned by Link, LinkedIn, where they identified 600 green occupations. I'll give you a sense of the scale of this as we move forward and the type of upskilling and training and higher education that we need to develop in order for us to, to, to meet the demands of climate action. For all of us, it's such an important agenda, of course. But we spend a lot of time as well working with small firms. This year, we expect to support somewhere of the order of 17,000 firms. And a lot of those are micro firms, about half of those are micro firms employing maybe 10, 10 or less people. So the, 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 these are the core to the employment in Ireland, as we know, the vast majority of private sector employment, as we know, is in the SME sector. And it's important that we work with small business owners to help their businesses be productive and competitive and innovative and that we can compete globally and that we don't slip back further in the productivity rankings versus other jurisdictions. So how we do that is really by addressing the skills needs and the management development needs of that small business owner or manager. And we do a lot of work, of course, in that space. Uh, we do a lot of work with the multinational sector, uh, working with IDEA and that agenda on, on a day-to-day -day basis and directly with the multinational firms. Um, we expect to support somewhere of the order of 1,100 multinational firms this year and 14,000 people working in the uh, uh, multinational sector, the FDI sector. Yet again, it's vital for the country that we, we, we build upon this wonderful success in creating a home for FDI to invest in Ireland, to prosper, to thrive, to grow, to encourage new investment and to create new jobs. And skills and talent intersects hugely with that. So it's a very, very important aspect of our work, a very strategic part of our, our work. And we're hugely supported by I, I, IDA and other colleagues on, on that agenda. And lastly is this, this question of innovation or workforce innovation that really cuts across everything that I said there, all of those first uh, four blocks that I've walked through. So this whole um, dimension of how innovation interplays with skills, interplays with workforce development, interplays with jobs of the future, interplays with future of work and so, and so on. And that we're, we're very much readying in Ireland and ensure that we have that future looking horizon scanning lens on skills all the time. And that feeds nicely into what we're gonna talk about on this call, which is around this, uh, this collaboration that we do with the university sector and the amount of future skills programs actually that come, come out of that. And I'll tell you a little bit about that in a second. Just quickly to introduce the organization, obviously we're on, under the Department of Further and Higher Education Research and Innovation under Minister Simon Harris. We, we get wonderful support from our colleagues in, into the department, really recognizing the value of industry-led, demand-led uh, skills development and the work that we're doing there and uh, delivering against government policy in that space. If we look at the board itself, we were established all the way back in 1999, so we're a long time up and running. Um, but you can see the major stakeholders in the, in the whole talent equation or the skills equation are represented there. And their, of course, are the state in the form of our ministerial representatives, the workers in, in the, the form of our representatives on our board from the Irish Congress of Trade Unions. And because we're an enterprise-led organization and an industry-led organization, we have a majority of employers on our board, including our chairperson, Brendan McGinty. 
and the skill in Ireland organization itself is re relatively lean and relatively small. Most of the delivery, of course, is done, practically all the delivery is done by the wonderful skill net networks, the length and, length and breadth of the country. Um, okay, uh, just just the last sort of introductory piece to let, 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 let um, our joiners in the call know a little bit about our funding model. So really, we, 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 we've been growing our funding um, but we've been growing our funding to meet the demands that are coming from us, from our industry partners, but also in, in helping to address and contribute to these major policy objectives, whether that's in digital skills, environmental skills, the sort of sectoral uh, policy framework that government has and the various strategies with industry sectors. And Skill in Ireland have numerous actions across a broad span of, of, of government policies and, and, and strategies. So it's important that we can build up the resources not only to meet, to, to meet the demands from our partners, but to meet those objectives that have been assigned to us and actions that have been signed to us across a, a plethora and a wide span of government policy. So we, 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 we have, I suppose, a three-legged stool, if to use that analogy, in terms of, of how, we're, how, how we build up our funding base. Primarily, we're funded uh, through the Exchequer and the National Training Fund, uh, which will see us uh, allocated 42 million this year. Um, we have been successful with engaging with our department and with the European Commission in carving out participation opportunities on EU programmes, yet again with great support from, from our department on it, uh, beginning this, this year with an 11 million programme under the Brexit Adjustment Reserve, and we're well placed for other opportunities as we move forward, so that EU programme strand is, is an important part of our funding model. I suppose the big thing I'd like to bring all, all, all our listeners' attention to is this private sector co-investment aspect of it. So our, 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 our investment model is very much a public-private collaboration. And this year, we forecast that employers will invest somewhere of the order of 25 million in uh, programs, upskilling programs developed through Skillnet Networks. So it's a major endorsement coming from companies, coming from business owners and managers to say, not only do we feel there's a demand and we want to engage with you on industry-led skills development, but we're going, to, we're going to make a financial investment to the scale of 25 million. So really what we're seeing there is the leveraging of the public investment. You know, so you know, when the exchequer, the taxpayer puts forward this money, we're able to draw in match funding from the private sector and make this you know, quite significant investment in the Irish workforce, which we expect to be forecast maybe around 78 million, slightly more than that, hopefully, if we can bring in more funding from the private sector, 78 to 80 million, somewhere of that order this year, we expect to invest. Okay, now I want to move uh, in conscious of time and we we saw we some great speakers to hear from, um, so I'm just mindful of that. So really what I want to do is to tee up this conversation. So we, we champion all forms of learning that lead to talent with the course a major eye on value for money, the caliber of provision, the QA and the evaluation of everything that we do. But we, we, we see it as very much a broad church and you know, we have a broad definition of what leads to talent development. Yet again, recalling in mind that we compete largely on the basis of our people, basis of our talent. So we should, you know, have a broad sort of a view, if you like, of what constitutes a, a talent. And you, you can see the type of span of provision typically that, that, that we would support. You know, now what I want to really would focus on is on the bottom left corner, which is this engagement that we've been working on really successfully with the university sector, with the IOTs, going back many years, going back 10 years at this point, and maybe even longer. And really, you know, how universities and our colleagues from the universities will talk about this, no doubt. You know, universities engage with companies in lots of different ways. You know, often it's around the executive education agenda. Perhaps it's around the uh, research and development agenda or the innovation agenda. You know, but what we really have targeted is this co-creation of programs. So bringing together industry and the university system to co-create programs that don't exist and that are really future looking and really looking over the horizon in terms of what's coming at us. And that, that's our future skills program that I, I'll introduce to you now and our colleagues in TU Dublin will, will, will expand in a really practical way around how, how, how they've actually applied this. So our skill, the Skill at Ireland Future Skills program is there to initiate to fund, then to develop and deliver higher education industry collaborative projects. And these projects all have three things in common. First is that they're future focused, are future skills focused, whether that's across digital, sustainability, and the list goes on. 
Um, the second characteristic that all of these programs that we develop with universities share is that there was a gap identified in existing provision before the universities and skill got involved. And that's core to what we do because we want to avoid duplication, of course, but it's really driven by market need, really driven by, you know, addressing a gap in provision that's related to future skills or to an emerging area. And the final characteristic, which is really the key one, is that it's an enterprise-led approach. So these needs, these gaps, if you like, are identified by companies in the first instance. They are then collated and distilled and brought up by the Skillnet network, by those 73 partners that I talked about earlier on. These proposals are then brought to Skillnet Ireland, and we award in the first instance development funding, or seed funding, if you want to call it that. And that allows the Skillnet networks to engage with the universities to develop the programs in the first instance, you know, to bring in the experts, consultants, whatever it may be, that have to ideate and work around these requirements, design the modules, and so on. So we provide up to 80% of the developmental cost to do that. And we, we the private sector tend to match them with the remaining 20%. So that gives this um, sort of a jolt or a shot of the arm in terms financially to actually you know, uh, to get the collaborations going. But the collaborations are much more important than the financial aspect because it's 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 through this requirements gathering from companies, then taking these high level requirements, bringing them to colleagues in the university system through a competitive tendering process, by the way. And from there, you see these programs beginning to co-create, meeting a gap in existing provision, highly future orientated and, and enterprise led in, in, in their, their approach. So once they're developed, they obviously then go into delivery and in delivery they fall into our normal cost sharing model which is typically anywhere between 50 50 right up to 70 30 dependent and depend and 70 often being the private sector contribution actually so so um it, it, it's it's there's a range if you like of, of, of pricing available but it goes into our cost sharing model where it's incentivized to make it more attractive for people in employment to engage in these programs we're going to hear our colleagues in DU Dublin give a wonderful example, so I don't want to, don't want to cut across their example uh, too, too much. Um, but just to give you a sense, you know, we, we, we have developed a whole range of programs, postgraduate, uh, undergraduate uh, offerings of various different kinds across, you know, technology, you know, manufacturing, digital, and many, many more fintech, food science, uh, micro credentialing, and the list goes on. I often use the example of uh, the the AI masters, and to give you a sense of that we call it the National uh, MSc in Artificial Intelligence, that's co-delivered by uh, colleagues in UL, DCU, and in NUIG. And the origins of that goes back three years ago when we did not have a postgraduate offering available in artificial intelligence. And that's an issue for us, and it was an issue, because if we're going to scale, grow and scale the tech presence that we have here, create more technology jobs, we have to be on the ball in these big emerging technologies like AI. And the absence of a postgraduate qualification was a bit of a pain point for companies in the tech sector. And that was being expressed to us by IDA and by others to say, look at what, how can we get involved to help companies tell us what they need in the first instance, and then bring those requirements to the university system and you know um it, 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 you know in uldcu and uig they stepped up and now we're seeing of the order of 300 enrollments in that ai masters every year and it's not just the, the enrollment it's what happens afterwards because the talent is there and the pipeline is there, you know, the, the contracts are being won, the new projects are coming to Ireland, you know, the AI related sort of developments and so on. We're now able to harness those opportunities because we have the talent and the skills and so on to deliver it. OK, just to give you just a broad sense, of this is my final slide and I'll hand back then. That just give you a sense of, 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 of the, the type of provision and how it spans. You know, you can see the, the broad sectors that's sweeping through and the, and, 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 and the courses offered there. Um, and you can see the NFQ provision, uh, and typically as you'd expect to see, obviously, as we engage with higher ed education institutes, it should look like that. And just in terms of the scale, this is 200, 2021, sorry, information, 438 programs were developed through the Skillnet Ireland University uh, co-creation, if you like, through our Future Skills program. So those are 438 programs that either didn't exist or were heavily customized, and of the order of over 4,000 students, you know, these are lifelong learners, people in employment um, who, who passed through those programs in the year 2021. OK, so thank you for, 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 for that. Uh, I, I hope I haven't overrun too, too much, Nora, and I've allowed enough time for, 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 for our, our, our speakers to come up. And I'm looking forward for, to the, to the Q&A in the end. So I think we're turning over to Roshi next, as I understand it, Jeff. Yeah. 
Thank you very much, Paul. Thank yeah, um, uh, Nora here. Um, thanks very much for that whistle stop tour. Um, I think that did um that did a lot to speak to the why and the how of um university skill net collab collaboration, which I suppose is why we're here today. So very um happy to now hand over to talk about a very specific example of um university and skillnet collaboration we have uh, dr roisin donnelly and we have Maeve coleman uh, from tu dublin um so please the floor is yours thank you very much nora and indeed paul uh, good afternoon everyone myself and my colleague Maeve. We're delighted to be here with you today to share our experiences from the School of Management in TU Dublin of our particular ICT Skillnet partnership and collaboration. It's a level nine part time MSc <clears throat> entitled Leadership, Innovation and Technology. And just want to say at the outset a sincere thanks to the IUA for this opportunity to talk to you and to share our experiences that have accumulated over time on this program. I think it's fair to say the MSc LIT can be called an early adopter really in the sense that it's a long running partnership with ICT Skillnet and it's important I think going forward with all be in agreement just to continue to raise awareness of its impact across the sector so we want to share some of that with you today. In terms of the actual collaboration itself I'll just take a moment perhaps first to explain the value gained from the collaboration and then Maeve as the programme coordinator is going to outline how that engagement model actually works in practice from TU Dublin's perspective. Um, when you look at those three bullet points there, it definitely seems a very succinct process, but as we all know, a lot of work by key people is invested in each of these stages as Paul has just outlined um, in terms of a particular need for knowledge and a demands knowledge and skill set. Um, is observed in the market by companies and brought to Skillnet Ireland. University partner is selected, but the piece we're going to focus on today is where the programme is delivered and evaluated. Um, I think that's where we can add most value to the conversation. In terms of value to the university, then, um, I think it can be useful to look at what factors influence the success of such a collaboration between industry and university. And a systematic study, a, a really good one back in 2019 by Rybanek and colleagues was published in the Journal of Business Economics, but it shed a lot of light on university industry collaborations. And from our perspective, we were particularly interested in the relationship factors that they, that they had outlined in that study. Um, they, they have a real impact on how the collaboration unfolds. And by relationship factors, we're talking about clear communication at all stages, the frequency of that communication with the key um, people involved on both sides is vital to create a shared understanding. There has to be that level of commitment on both sides of trust, of sharing our mutual expectations at the start and revisiting them as we go through um, regular interaction. We, we do continuous feedback in terms of we share student feedback and equally um, ICT Skillnet share the feedback with the programme team as well. And that mutual exchange of information is important for updating each other about new activities that would be involved in going forward as well. As well as I think having the right team on board, the programme team expertise and experience brings so much to the table. I suppose another requirement for a successful collaboration from our experience really is the language that we use that's suitable for both partners. We do know all of us the collaborations can be affected by the use of different terminology, different understandings, different styles from the academic and the business environments. A recent example even for our perspective is that we would make exceptional entry cases to support student applications based on their professional experience. So it was very useful to revisit that conversation in terms of what's involved in that process, making sure that everybody understands from start to finish on that. And I suppose what's captured there, the applied nature of the assignments on the programmes. There's no exams 
we held an induction there last Thursday evening and the students were delighted to hear that it's authentic assessment the whole way through from the beginning of the programme, work focused essays, presentations, frameworks and audits, really all related to the professional context of the students involved. And that year one is, is really important to underpin leading into the applied research in the second year of the master's. There's a 60 credit um, project, consultancy project, applied project. And what we find over the years, and um, Maeve can speak more to this, but there's been an extraordinarily high level of quality work produced. And so much so that in a recent one of our communications with ICT skill nets, one of our meetings, we identified a clear space for how we could disseminate this work. And Maeve was very successful in applying for National Forum Teaching and Learning funding. And there's a symposium being planned in September to showcase the high quality applied work that's coming out of the program. We do know here today that a primary goal of universities is the production of knowledge, those research results that can be publicly accessed and publicly used. So these dissemination events and this symposium, I think in particular, will enable this to take place. So on to the next slide then, just very briefly outlining our executive education partners and the value to industry then. Here are just some of the organizations that the Faculty of Business and TU Dublin have been very successfully engaging with over the years, very much so in an executive education context that Paul had mentioned there. But in relation to the MSC Leadership Innovation Technology Programme, the companies from which students um, are based um, are Accenture, Intel, AIB, Amazon, we have Workday and a wide number of assorted SMEs and multinationals. So it's fantastic that that continues to grow from year to year across the program. And I suppose in talking about uh, sustainability of the program, it's in the realm of about 16 years going strong today more than ever. Um, despite changes in personnel on both sides of the partnership, um, those early relationship ties that were made have strengthened and grown over time, and that's great to see. Um, there's transformative and impactful research. Uh, one example of this is students on the programme being asked and required to develop a, an impact and an engagement plan a very specific plan in relation to what the implications and recommendations for their research will be. So they're asked to reach out to their companies again, to the different departments and wider to share the implications of their research. And indeed that subject matter expertise across the three pillars of leadership, technology and innovation is key to success as well. Um, just on those three pillars, the range of topics in recent years there's been omnichannel technology support models investigated, uh, female intrapreneurship in technology, analysis of technologies and SMEs, and then into the kind of the, the leadership domain, exploration of gender stereotype threat on particular video conferencing platforms, investigating innovation capabilities of staff, and looking at how leadership itself can manifest itself in innovation teams and so much more. That's just a small sample there. And as I said, we're looking forward to showcasing all of that in our September symposium with the, with the companies involved. Um, okay, I think I'll hand over to Maeve now. Again, I'm keeping an eye on time. I know Nora was keen for the Q&A to have sufficient time. So Maeve's gonna provide an overview now on how the TU Dublin ICT Skillnet model works at a practical level. So thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Rasheen. Um, hello, I'm Maeve and I'm lucky enough to be the programme uh, chair of this wonderful Masters. Um, every year I become really excited about welcoming in a new cohort and watching all of our graduates, um, you know, go back into their organisations and provide real impact into um, their business, um, no matter no matter what they choose to do in their uh, in their thesis. 
And so in my part of the presentation as program chair, I'm going to sort of respond to a couple of questions um, that firstly came in prior to, to uh, undertaking the, the uh, presentation, um, but also I think some issues that Paul and Rashin have highlighted in how, how it works and why it works from a very practical perspective. Um, so some key features, you'd be surprised how um, the industry skills needs filter down into the programmatic structure. And one of the things that sets this um, master's apart is our heavy focus on a major research project in second year. So we do all of our taught modules in first year across three knowledge domains. And as Roshan, Roshan's pointed out, uh, you know, not only do you get that focus on subject matter expertise, but also on leadership and strategy as well. Um, so the students carry out um, uh, 30 ECTS in, in their first year across those three knowledge domains. And then we go into the major research project, which involves a significant effort. And it's very brave to offer 60 ECTS a thesis at master's level. By comparison, master's possibly might go from 15 to 25 ECTS and teach uh, along uh, uh, modules alongside that, particularly for full-time students. Um, but what we found is that um, because of the programmatic structure and in fact the rollout it's not only suitable for industry because we use friday day-long sessions for our instruction uh, but it also enables the assessment strategies enable peer learning and mba style teaching which were, were things that were very important not only upon commencement of the program which is now in its 16th year as you know but on an every every time we evaluate it through our quality assurance processes this comes up again the nature of the teaching and the pedagogy that we use uh, to engage as being that of um, an applied um, an applied nature and one which facilitates that peer learning, which is very strong. So I'm going to talk through a couple. So that's how it works on the practical level. But I'm going to also work through uh, some feedback from industry on why it works and also from our students, because it's not just industry that gives us the feedback. We also have, uh, you know, our student and our community feedback as well. Um, so what the program does is it's designed to transition learners from subject matter experts to future leaders. And I suppose this is where the future skills um, uh, aspect comes in from what Paul was discussing either uh, earlier. Uh, we work with Technology Ireland ICT Skillnet um, and the blend of innovation, critical thinking and strategy are vital to that outcome to, to the students and learners meet the, the, the learning outcomes. Um, you know, what industry enjoyed was blended delivery model and that's from, well, it works on the student from the student perspective as well, uh, but from an industry perspective in a very tight talent pool that's around at the moment, um, people human resources their people are incredibly important and it's just not possible to sort of give up large longer blocks when the operational requirements are so um intense at the moment uh, in that post covid uh, era and of course the no examination thing is always uh, it's always a great uh, <laughs> it's always a great lure um but what it means is that uh, we can actually facilitate applied learning from the minute the student walks in the door. So they're starting to look at their own up organization using the theoretical lenses of our three subject matter domains. And that has immediate impact. And we haven't even gotten to the very large research project that they, that they undertake in second year. So it's very positive experience for students. Um, we uh, also kind of examine what the students think and feel. And again, they reiterate time and time again, the format as being, we have 12 Friday rollout every year and that suits them because they can set that side of time and make an, uh, side, time aside, make an agreement with their employer to, to be able to facilitate that. And employers, I'd say 99.999% of the time will support that because they see that imme immediate benefit. But also something that's incredibly important is flexibility. 
and we embed flexibility across things like submission deadlines, uh, things like, um, you know, our, we, we have a May intake, for example. So we have a staggered kind of programmatic effect with rest uh, breaks built into it and it, it works really well for people as well. Of course, we have um, program chair support, um, but also support from our community. And that means our teaching team, our team of supervisors, and the students can't speak more highly of their teaching team and supervisors. Neither can I, and Rashin is the same. We're very, very lucky to have the team that we have, but students support each other also. We facilitate that through the use of uh, regular meetups in a COVID environment, but now that we're going back to blended, um, just being able to support that in a few different ways. And finally, our alumni who always come back and talk to the students uh, during their uh, two two phases of their their uh, their journey they, they come in and they, they speak freely about why they chose the program in first year we have guest speakers from this program come in and just light up the academic environment in other areas as well and um, through our merging technology series of um of uh, talks and uh, yeah the we're, every year that goes on, we're ju we just keep getting a richer and richer environment from which to base that learning. Um, and I feel that's probably from the practical perspective, moving on from uh, Paul and Rashin's um, uh, experiences and, and presentations, you know, the how and why of um, yeah how it works for us. So yeah, I'm not sure if we're taking questions now, Nora, but uh, I can stop sharing. Yeah, that's uh, great. Thanks very much, Rashi and May, for that presentation. Um, so I'm conscious of time and I want to uh, give as much time as possible to the Q&A um, section. Um, so um, I was going to uh, make a few points from Dr. Dr. Amy Jane Troy's uh, presentation on the uh, various um, skill, skill net um, re relationships that the, um, the food industry training unit um, in the School of Food and Nutritional Sciences in UCC has. But what we will do is we, we we will um, circulate her slides al along with the slides um, that were presented today. So please, uh, colleagues, feel free to raise your hand using the raise hand uh, function and um, I'm happy to uh, bring you in. But thank Thank you also to those of you who, who pre-submitted um, questions. So what we might do is kick off with a few quick fire ones. Um, Paul, we had quite a few um, pre-submitted questions, I suppose, um, um, on the how. Um, so it might be an opportunity for some, some more scenes setting. Some of the questions that came through um, include, you, you know, which um, levels on the national framework of qualifications do skill net pro programs usually sit and um, do you have a, pre a preferred mode of delivery and um, are skill net programs usually part-time or full-time um, and finally how can skill how can skill net and universities share um understand understanding on current and future skills needs Thank you, Nora. Um, I might just break break the question down into, into a couple of uh, bits, if that's okay. Absolutely. So, so maybe just start starting, you know, by by going back to our model, so and our approach. So, you know, with an industry led approach, you know, we, we try not to kind of categorize or curtail what the provision will look like, you know, because it's it's driven by demand, it's driven by the needs of the coal face. And, and, you know, and taking that concept of talent as a broad thing that includes, of course, higher education provision, but private provision, you know, uh, professional education from industries or professional bodies, you know, spanning right up to CPD and, 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 and so on. So, you know, we really look at it from a lens of demand led, you know, is it addressing a gap? You know, and then we go on to, you know, measure value for money, you know, impact and an evaluation in the normal way, as you'd expect. So, 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 so we, we tend not, um, you know, to place any sort of restrictions or, or to, to constrain what that provision will, will, will look like, because it, it, it peters up almost naturally. Maybe that's the best way to do it. Now, when we look at the, 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 the extent of the higher engagement provision about, about, about what we do, if we look at it in terms of, of our, our training days, let's say, as, as a measure in any given year, 
the, the, the overwhelmingly the majority would be higher education type provision. Yet again, along the lines of what Rajina may have explained, you know, that had its roots in a skill net in the first instance, you know, the university stepped up to collaborate together and you see a wonderful program like the, like was just presented that is 15, 16 years in delivery and had its original oranges in, in, in an industry need, but you've heard how, how, how it's evolved and how was it adjusted and changed and responded to the various needs of industry and that type of deep engagement, for example, on project work, you know, so practical, so hands-on, so led from the cold face, you know, so it's not just when these programs are delivered, it's 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 how the universities and the skill net kind of knit themselves together in this long term relationship, and I think that was really well explained by Maven Rashi in in, in 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 their example. So so we 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 don't place those those kind of constrictions on, on, on the type of vision, but obviously hugely mindful of impact value for money, and of course everything that we do is through um, you know a, you know competitive transparent uh, tender processes and so on, and that encourages actually you know you know really strong provision of it of itself just to speak quickly to the to the engagement model and I think we, we we've all learned that you, you don't force collaboration you know the, the collaboration has to happen on, 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 on a basis of you know want and willingness and and, and and so on but we have found that when universities like we've, we've wonderful relations with, with, with TU Dublin going back many years over multiple programs and Rashi and Maeve will know that from dealing with our colleagues on a day-to-day -day basis you know we, we we've enjoyed a long-standing relationship with, with, with TU Dublin but when I talked to, to, to colleagues there they would say look at what this has given us as a gateway this has given us a, a kind of easy ready-made gateway to engage directly with companies you know taking away some of those barriers that are involved in maybe you know you know um, forging out co company contacts and all that stuff that goes with it and that that would be my call to action to all people on the call here from the university sector is to think about the opportunity that working with a skill net brings to engage directly off of this tunnel, if you like, this pathway straight into companies, you know, and all of that is, if you like, curated through a program, which is this future skills program, which would be in the very roots of, of the course, um, the, the, the masters that, that, that Maven Roshin introduced us to. That had its roots way back in, 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 in its, when it was initialized through, through our future skills program. So, so the, the, the one, the, it, it offers many benefits to these engagement, but above and beyond the biggest one is this path with this gate into, in, into companies. And, um, I suppose the easiest starting point on a practical level would be to visit the Skill in Ireland website. You know, there's a directory of all the 73 Skill Net networks. There's a description of all of them. There's the contact points and so on. And even that, you know, investigation, you know, desk exercise for an hour or so, and you navigate these various different Skill Net networks, and you might begin to see, wow, there's a possible point of alignment. You know, there's a project that we're interested in. I wonder would that particular Skill Net in that given sector um, see that this is common ground or could we work together? Now, we also play an important role, Skill at Ireland, as, as the intermediary agency, if you like, in between the industry and universities. And often it's, it's us that's doing the outreach and doing the connections with the universities. And yet again, I'd say to everybody in this call, if you want to reach out to me directly at any point or to any of my colleagues, you know, if you need an introduction to a skill net or if there's an idea you want to bring to us. You know, we're an ideas or organization. We thrive on ideas. You know, it's the roots of everything that we do. So we, we, would, we would openly encourage any of the universities institutes that are here on the phone with us on this call rather to come to us with your ideas either directly to skill at ireland or, or just to navigate through our directory of 73 networks and that's the start of the process and then you can begin an engagement then you can begin the requirements gathering then you can start you know distilling up from the coal phase what these skills gaps are you know what, you know and and build that up into requirements which we would then seed fund the development of and then once it's developed of course it goes into delivery to the skill net Ireland cost sharing model in the normal way so I, I, that was a long-winded answer Nora I hope, I hope it got to the, uh, to the question absolutely that was uh, very helpful Paul um, and I think very uh, clear I think the message there is get in touch um, and uh, cert cert certainly some of the themes you were talking 
talk, talking about that about there were coming through very very strongly through um Dr. Dr. Amy Jane uh, Troy's presentation in UCC in terms of skillnet being a key tool um for the con connectedness of the um food food industry training unit there uh, the connectedness to enterprise and she and she she, she also spoke about the sus sus sustainability of those relationships um one uh, key topic coming through the, the pre-submitted questions, and I suppose it's not surprising considering how much of a, of a hot topic um, it is at the moment, was, of course, micro-credentials. And I suppose how, um, how Skillnet um, and university collaboration and how that lo looks in a micro-credential world. Um, I'm conscious we have a, a number of colleagues from the IUA microcreds project um, on the call who may wish to um, come in because I do know that there is some uh, collaboration happening there. Um, but while I wait to see if if um, hands are uh, coming up, maybe first Roisin to you. How does how does that work from the TU Dublin pers perspective? Thanks, Nora. And as you said, yes, it's, it's certainly a hot topic and um, we can see it at our national level. We can see it within institutions and then we can see it at the European level. From the TU Dublin perspective, um, there's been working groups set up this year. Um, I'm sitting on one on digital badges for recognition and um, that's coming to the close of its work next month in terms of introducing digital badges policy and procedures for TU Dublin and equally there's one in terms of micro credentials for accreditation purposes and they sit really well and I think this is a key point with um, your university's approach to education TU Dublin. Um, have a new university education model, a UEM, with 10 um, very well thought through principles, which include looking at flexible pathways for learning paths for students. It's looking at um, this imaginative and judicious use of technology that can be done in terms of the motor delivery of micro-credentials. And it's looking at embedded engagement with just what we're talking about here today, our industry and our community partners. So certainly going forward, micro-credentials um, is a very exciting um, approach uh, for uh, looking at partnership TT skill nets about six weeks ago to talk about micro-credential opportunities through our programs, such as the one we talked about with Maeve. We also have another one on global business services at level nine part-time. So there's lots of opportunities going forward. Uh, I see Lynn has her hand up, though, as she said, in terms of the IUA project. Thanks very much, Roisin. Lynn, would you like to come in from the, the IUA microcreds pers perspective? Thanks very much, Nora, and thanks, Roisin. Lovely to see you. I think mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's lovely to, to mention, I think, in this context, the work the National Forum has done in terms of those digital credentialing opening badges, because I think it put us in a lovely space where we we had done a lot of the initial thinking about what that might look like in, in an academic context and then in a, in a professional development context. Um, thanks, Nora. I suppose just to say that we're delighted to be working with Paul and his team at Skillnet. We certainly opened up um, initial conversations um, to see what the relationship could be like in terms of building out the work on micro-credentials, working with colleagues in Skillnet, and, the, and, and as Paul described, that opportunity to bring together a group of enterprise um, in a relevant disciplinary area or a, or a cohort of, of enterprise has been really helpful in terms of us crystallising our thinking about what the sustainable engagement looks like, because as you know, we've developed out this model of enterprise um, university uh, engagement called Microcreds Innovate, and um, it aligns very well with that whole philosophy that Paul describes about enterprise identifying their particular needs in the context of current or future skills gaps and then coming to work together to see what that solution would be. And I think one of the advantages that universities bring in that context is they can imagine maybe a different type of solution than the enterprise had first identified when they come with a with a 
something that's not working, maybe not even as crystallized as a specific training need. So I, I was interested to get Paul's sense of some of that, that kind of coming together, Paul, around identifying a solution um, and, and thinking creatively in the moment and longer term. So I was interested in that space. And then also the other piece that's becoming increasingly important to our work is how the work in the micro-credentialing space and in the skills development space fits into a broader discussion around competency frameworks. Um, and I know, Roshi, this would have been a lot of your work as well in the National Forum in terms of that competency framework piece. So I was interested in those two areas. Nora, thanks for the opportunity to, to ask. Thanks so much. Um, really great to hear about the um, progress there. Um, something else that's uh, very much um, happening, I suppose, at the uh, sectoral and institutional level are, um, is uh, work on uh, recognition of prior learning. And um, thanks, uh, Marion, uh, very much for the question, question in the chat. You weren't the only one to um, pose a question on recognition of prior learning. We had a few come in um, in the uh, pre-submitted questions too. So I suppose maybe Paul, to pose it to you first, um, what uh, role does does RFPL play in supporting university skill, skill net collab, cl collaboration? And do you use, um, do you use RFPL in, um, in um, access to skill net programs? Sure, um, um, I might just pop, pop back to Lynn's question just really briefly before I get on to the, uh, the yeah. RPL. Um, and you know, one of the wonderful early stages of a cl collaboration with, with the micro-credentialing project in IUA, and we're really excited about it. But yet again, when, when we throw kind of an industry lens on it, um, you know, wh what companies are telling us about micro-credentialing, what they really like are things like the short lead in time to certification. And we, we find that we can actually speed that up if we look at credentialing in an industry-led way and through the skill net model. So that sort of speed, that responsiveness is really valued by companies. And then you layer onto that, you know, the flexibility of learning in terms of how micro-credentialing can be packaged to really fit with the modern world of work, to put it that way. And it's the combination of these two factors. You know, when you bring in the responsiveness, you bring in, the, you know, the speedy sort of responses, the flexibility, and putting them together, you know, really talking to immense potential, I think, in micro-credentialing. And it really is, it really is a, a major future trend, I think, that all, all of us, need, you know, really need to grasp, and we are grasping, you know, because in in in, in many ways, I, I believe it's the future of skills, and certainly the future of credited skills, it will, will be true, true my, my, micro-credentialing. Just to pick up on the RPL piece, you know, um, the, we, we have a great track record, um, particularly in, in, in RPL when it, when it is applied to the retail sector. And, um, it, you know, thought leadership and uh, I would say some really early movers in this space came from the Retail Ireland Skillnet, who are the uh, representative organ organization Retail Ireland through, through IBEC and the large membership of uh, retail organizations and companies, large and small throughout Ireland. And anyone in the retail sector, you know, will tell you it's an intense, it's a busy environment, it's hard to, you know, to be offline, it's hard to be out of the workflow attending programs and, and so on. So RPL was a really great fit there. And hundreds of people, hundreds if not more, uh, people within the, the re retail sector, probably into the thousands if we, if we go back over, over the many years they've been involved in this, have gotten themselves onto the accreditation ladder, you know, who are seeing career progression, opening up new opportunities through workplace learning and the application of RPL. And we we have a wonderful case study in, in, in the re retail sector. And I'm not sure if there's any colleagues on from the retail skill that could even add to that, but it, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's really, um, in many ways, a marriage made in heaven. It was a, a sector that really lent itself to RPL and to an approach of work-based learning and very innovative ways were, were developed. A lot of Kenny IT were really at the fore of this in working with us on it and working with the retail skill net, you know, and, you know, how learning was being captured, how experiential learning was being captured in the learning logs to meet that sort of um, uh, academic sort of standards that were required, you know, and a lot of innovations happened around that that we're really proud of. And there's a great case, case study there for anyone on the call who, who wants to follow it up. Thanks very much for that, Paul. And um, there's a there's a few um, a few uh, comments coming through the chat on uh, that particular point. I'm conscious that we're at 2 p.m., so I would like to pose um, a final.
final question, please, to the panel, uh, which was, I think, a really great one that came that came through. Um, what are the key components of university enterprise collaboration as you see them um, um, as they have uh, developed through university skill net collaboration? So, Roisin, I might come to you first um, to res respond to that. Just essentially in a nutshell, I know it has to be quick, um, what I just spoken about in the presentation, the, the key one is the relationship piece going first. Um, and I'd mentioned all of the attributes in terms of engagement, interaction, trust, mutual expectations, etc. And added to that then is that there's, you know, a united agreement on the output factors as well, such as the knowledge transfer, the technology innovation transfer. It has to be reciprocal in that sense. And from our perspective on this particular program with ICT SkillsNet, we, we find that the whole way through. And I think that's, um, can attest to how it's been going for 16 plus years and going stronger now than ever before. So that very quickly, yeah. Thank you very much, Paul. Final couple of words to you on that same question, please. Yeah, just just a, we're, we're over time, so I just I suppose just to come back to my call to action, if I could, Nora. You know, we 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 want to engage. We've enjoyed great 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 success, uh, mutual success, both at the universities, the skill nets, and skill net Ireland in these collaborative projects, uh, and come to us with our ideas. That's the call to action, whether that's directly to skill net Ireland or if you want to, uh, you know, direct, directly get in contact and begin those engagements with with with, with, with the skill nets. You know, we see very productive collaborations and, and we've heard some really good examples of it here and it's what the country needs you know it puts us it adds that competitive edge where we you know are constantly developing our workforce keeping it on the ball finger on the pulse in terms of where the next shift is going to happen and this, you know the, the responsiveness to the university sector working with skillnet on that agenda is has is, is been tremendous and we want to do more of it so that's our call to action that's very clear. Thank you very much, Paul. And um, we will be um, circulating the slides, like I said, from uh, from the presentations. Those will, I suppose, include contact details. So that call to action is there. Um, and please do keep in touch. Um, keep in touch too with um, the IUA as um, as this work uh, progresses. So um, I'm afraid we've reached our time. I don't know how, quite how that has happened so quickly. Um, thanks very much to our speakers. Thanks very much to um, the IUA staff who have helped to support today. Thanks very much to you all for being here um, and happy Monday every, um, everyone. Slán and take care. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.